Welcome to the Talk Spot. This is Marcus, and today I'm joined by Gary Wayne, author of Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Gary, thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me back and uh, looking forward to the discussion we're going to have today. Well, perfect. So uh, how, how have you been? Have you been up to any new projects or anything like that? Are you working on any new books? Uh, I'm, I am working on a new book, but I haven't had uh, much time to uh, spare to, to get at it. So I'm, uh, you know, 150, 200 pages into it, but I need to uh, get back at it. And it's going to be more of a prophecy book. You know, my publisher is looking for me to do a uh, sequel to the Genesis 6 conspiracy. So maybe I'll look at doing that as well. But um, so, yes, I do have a book started. And I have another conference that's coming up at the end of March in Dallas. Um, if anybody uh, is interested in, in coming to to the conference, it's the um, Hear the, Hear, Hear the Watchers conference. And uh, it should be uh, another well-attended conference. So looking forward to doing that and then looking at another one uh, later in the summer. Well, great. That definitely, that sounds, that sounds very cool. Um, yeah, so definitely, if you want to, um, maybe if you want to send me an email with uh, the link to that conference, then I could put in the description of this video if you like. Sure, absolutely. That would be good. Maybe I'll send you the one I did in November as well at the Operation Classified with the Caravan to Midnight people as well. Well, well perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so recently, there's been a movie that came out a couple months, or I guess now almost a month ago, called Aquaman, and a major theme of the film Aquaman is the city of Atlantis or the lost civilization of Atlantis. And um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about yeah, what, you know, I guess about Atlantis itself, um, you know, maybe some of its history and maybe some of the occult ties to Atlantis. So maybe if you wouldn't mind, could you describe a little bit of the history of Atlantis for the people that don't really know much about it? Yeah, it's probably one of the more famous uh, stories that come out of prehistory and you know, it has connections and roots to many other civilizations as, as we come through the, you know, the fog of prehistory. The most clear and precise and most quoted version for Atlantis would have been done by Plato. And he did two. One wasn't completed, but the two works that he did was Timaeus and Critias, which details the Atlantean uh, mythology that most people refer to. And there are some other versions out there that have pieces of it and add some more pieces to the puzzle. But I would guide people in that direction if they wanted to get the more, most clear picture of it. And Atlantis, in the antediluvian epoch or before the flood, was the most advanced civilization on earth at that time and one presumes from that that there were many civilizations and there uh, could have been uh, four seven or nine depending on which aspect of mythology one one wants to look at in terms of trying to figure out how many societies that they that there were and the interesting thing about atlantis is is it is viewed as the pre-flood helm of world government, which is important uh, in, in looking at how some of the ramifications of that, that mythos comes down through history and particularly into prophecy that maybe we'll, we can touch on a little bit later. But it was where uh, the god Poseidon ruled, and Poseidon is the god of the sea in Greek mythology, and also known as Iapetus. And so there's, when you see some versions of Atlantis, keep in mind both names of that god because they're typically regarded as the same god and the stories are pretty similar. And so Poseidon or Iapetus, they take a human female and takes that human female as a wife, and the name, again, in various different transliterations and branches of the Atlantean mythology would be Clido or Clymene and several variations of both of those names. And he has 10 Titan kings through this marriage. So they're demigods. And in Greek mythology, you can have a Titan that is a lower god that's created from a male and female god. And then you can have the demigods, which are created uh, by... Uh, a god like Zeus uh, and a human female to create 
you know, a Titan hero like Hercules or Theseus or, or Perseus. In this case, we're talking about Poseidon, and he creates 10 of these giant Titan Nephilim demigods who are going to rule over his kingdom. And so Atlantis is larger than one kingdom. It actually has branches of 10 different states working together as part of this sort of world empire they're trying to conquer. And so it branches out into North Africa, into Spain and Portugal, into England and into Ireland, over into uh, Central America. And all of these areas have a king that rules over, which are all an offspring of, of Poseidon. And so you have these Nephilim kings that are trying to bring about a world government. And that story is very, very similar in terms of an angel or a god having... Uh, sex with a human female to create Nephilim or demigods that's recorded in Genesis 6. And so this empire rules for a, a long period of time, as, as we understand it, but it, it grows from being a righteous kingdom in the Greek mythology to having these kings turn into more of dictators and tyrants and despots, and they grow directionally and and more and more evil as they go and turning against other uh titan kings and and humans in particular in a very very vicious way to the point where the gods can no longer sort of accept what's going on in the atlantean empire and they're afraid of them i guess taking over the whole world although we understand that they are defeated by the uh pre-flood greeks uh uh, led by Hercules and Theseus, but the flood is still brought on because of all of the violence and the crime and the debauchery that's going on in the entire ancient world. And Atlantis, as long as with these other civilizations that I had mentioned previously, are destroyed by the flood and a conflagration of many other catastrophes. So it's not just a a flood narrative is, is what most people would understand, but a flood is a significant part of it. But there's volcanoes, and there's earthquakes, and there's this tradition of three meteors or stars of the Pleiades, which crashes into the ocean that starts off this chain of, of catastrophic, catastrophic events. So in a brief nutshell, that's the Atlantean uh, mythology, and that it was loaded with technology, and it was loaded with uh, magic and priests and the religion thereof. So it's a very, very sort of rich, almost, I would call a parallel story as to what Genesis is telling me. And Genesis probably is one is part of the Sumerian uh, pre-flood civilization that, if you wanted to connect it to where that would fit in in in, in in relationship to Atlantis. Mm. So we know that in, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the chapter, I guess it's chapter four of Genesis, that it mentions that Cain, after he kills Abel, that he goes on to found the first city. Is that any way at all connected to Atlantis? Uh, I'm not sure it's connected to Atlantis, but it sort of suggests that idea that there were other people out there uh, and that there was another civilization that he goes to because he goes to the land of Nod and he finds a wife and he has a son very quickly thereafter. We're not told where the wife comes from, but he chooses to build a city very, very quickly. And so one wonders, why would you build a city if there is only one or two and then three people, right? And there wouldn't be a whole lot more that you would require to build a whole city thereafter. And if you build a city, particularly in the Antediluvian Epoch and shortly after the flood for the first few thousand years, you have cities being built as city-states that they have all these high walls because you needed to protect yourselves. So this is all that's being kind of implicated in that narrative, but yet the Bible doesn't tell us where these people come from. And it's unlikely that the wife that Cain chooses comes from uh, Adam and Eve because there aren't any other siblings that are born until Adam is 130 years old. And we take from 
the Canite story of being ostracized, that this probably happened somewhere between 20 and 50 years old. So there's this period after the ostracization before Seth is born, which is the third born son, because Cain had killed Abel previous. And only sons and daughters, only daughters were born after that. And that happened when Adam was 130 years. Hmm. So I, I guess you mentioned something about the idea of the pre-flood <laughs> Greeks. So were the pre-flood Greeks, were they, did they have a, I guess, a unique relationship with the Atlanteans? Or was it, they just happened to exist at the same time? And, and also when you say pre-Greek, or sorry, pre-flood Greeks, um, were they that much different than post-flood Greeks? Oh, I think so, to a certain degree. Um, so to answer the first question, I think, again, that there was multiple civilizations before the flood. And Atlantis is a Greek mythology, even though it comes from uh, Egypt, where Solo, Solon travels to and, and, and is... Um, and he reads from the pillars of the story by, you know, that he's shown by the Egyptian priests. But the, it, it is a Greek mythology, and Poseidon is a god of the Greeks. So you have that sort of relationship. I, so I think that it's related to the Greek antediluvian society, and where Hercules comes from is more inside the Mediterranean area, just as Theseus does. And these are the these are a couple of the heroes that are are going to actually fight against the Atlantean Empire. So I think they're very much connected to a similar originating source that goes out and later develops separate civilizations. Now, as far as moving this forward to after the flood, again, from a polytheist or a mythology perspective, you have these heroes being locked in and also called titans, and then I explained that earlier, you can call them both. Just as Atlas, who's the king of At uh, of Atlantis, is called a titan, just to, to give an example. The leaders of the rebellion and probably the worst of the rebels were locked into a prison in Greek mythology called Tartarus. And in this line of thinking, in this line of mythology, after the flood, these titans escape out of Tartarus, which is thought to be located in the Scythia region or in around the, uh, the, the Black Sea area in, um, in the Turkey region. And they will go and procreate and begin civilizations after the flood because they've escaped out of the flood or out of, out of Tartarus. And what's interesting about that is, is Iapetus, Poseidon has uh, uh, some other offspring, um, not necessarily from Clymene or Clado, but uh, from other females, and he creates God's name, Albion, Magog, and Gog. And what's interesting about that is, is in, in the Genesis uh, narrative after the flood, we have descendants of Japheth who are moving into that Greek area and, and likely intermarrying with those people and taking on the names Gog and Magog. And it was not, it's not uncommon for descendants after the flood to take on giants' names as part of their nomenclature. Mm. Oh, that's, wait, so Gog and Magog, that's... Because I know that in Revelation, doesn't it say... Something about an army coming from Gog and Magog, or am I mistaken? Oh, you know, you know, you're not mistaken. There's actually, uh, and some people conflate the two, but there's actually two accounts of a Gog and Magog war. So the one you're referring to is in Revelation 20, which happens after Armageddon. In fact, a thousand years after Armageddon, when Satan is released again, and Gog and Magog are going to march on Jerusalem and try and take over the world again. But the other war is in the end time with Gog and Magog that's recorded in Ezekiel 37 and 38. We know this is the end time because it talks about it as the end time or the latter days or in the last days. It's all the same sort of meaning in prophecy. And it's led by Gog and Magog out of the north. And there's a whole bunch of other nations of that are part of the alliance. And this is the same war that's described in Joel 1 and 2 
which has beings that look like scorpions and all sorts of dreadful monsters, which is the same war as uh, is described in Revelation 9, when the abyss is opened in the end time, and Abaddon and Apollyon, one's a Greek name and one is a Hebrew name, I put them in the reverse order there, lead these beings who come up out of the abyss, which is the same sort of word that's used in Greek for the abyss is Tartarus. So we have this keys of the abyss being unlocking uh, these beings in the end time, and they're going to bring about a 200 million man war. And this is going to be the war that looks like Armageddon, that Antichrist is going to come in and win uh, quickly and take credit for winning it at least and try and bring peace on the earth. So we've got two different wars, but you're absolutely right that you have those names that are very dominant in prophecy, which is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to understand prehistory so you can understand prophecy. So I think there's going to be an impact in the end time and then again at the end of the millennium of these descendants of these giants that we've been talking about that all connect back to Atlantis. Mm. And you said this all started with Poseidon, right? That Poseidon was the one that he founded Atlantis and that he's also the one that gave birth to children named Gog and Magog? Yes, yes, and, and, and other giants. But he's not the only one. So, like I said, when you get into Greek mythology, and the best example is Hercules, well, he's the son of Zeus. So, and he, he also took a human female. And so all of these famous heroes in Greek mythology, whether it's Theseus or Perseus or Achilles or King Minos, these are all Nephilim Titan giants. And they're all kings and warriors. Hmm. So with, with Nephilim, do you believe that, do they have a lifespan similar to humans? And what happens to them once they physically die, or do they physically die? Um, yeah, well, there's two aspects to this. So you have the original creation, which I think has a kind of a different set of rules, although it's not uh, totally settled that this is the case. But the original demigods and, and and they're called demigods because demigods as you take that back to its ancient meaning it means the offspring of a human female and a god and in these accounts and in the book of enoch um which i know isn't in the bible but explains the 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 scenario quite well in a parallel way the gods were able to pass on the immortal spirit into these physical beings on the earth. So you have a physical God in the physical world uh, with this immortal spirit. In Genesis 6, 3, God moves to limit life after that. That's why it's in the Nephilim creation narrative, 220 years. And again, if somebody wants a, a detailed document on that, I, I've got that. Just get a hold of me through my website and I'll send it to you. Uh, and so you have the original Nephilim that are created, we're not told how many or how many violations against the laws of creation are made, but we understand there's probably quite a few, that this first group has an immortal spirit in them. Now, their body, because they don't have access to the tree of life, is not going to be immortal because it's physical, but the spirit is, is immortal. So when they either committed suicide because their body had become too... Um, degraded or they were killed and generally that's done by taking the head for whatever reasons uh, that's generally the way these these demigods were killed and also part of where the dragon um, not the dragon but the vampire dracula mythology comes from um, which again is a rabbit hole you don't have time to probably go down today but uh, their body would die but their physical spirit wouldn't but it wouldn't go to sleep like in humans and it wasn't permitted to go into heaven. And so these spirits that were uh, without a body are what we know as the demons. And they're always looking for, for a body to, to possess. Now, when we move forward past that generation where you have second generations of Nephilim, and then after the flood where we have giants show up again, which is probably a second incursion, but there's other possibilities that they survive the flood. Are these ones, do their spirits go to sleep, or are they like 
uh, uh, the same as the original. We're not sure. But what we do know is is that their lives shortened over time as well. So maybe it was this the physical body or maybe it's the spirit. We don't know about subsequent generations. Okay. Okay. Well, um, wow, that this this definitely this will there's certainly a, a lot to unpack there. Um, so I guess for for Poseidon, then obviously, um, I mean, they call him the god of the sea. I mean, was it in his relationship to Atlantis? Was it because he actually had any powers itself over the sea, or is it more connected to the fact that Atlantis was a sea a sea going empire? Well, he had powers over the sea, and he was the god of that civilization, um, and the one that they that that they worshipped. And so he had very much uh, power and control over the destinies and and what he could do with 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 people. Um, he had an interplay with the other gods, um, and these are the Olympic. Uh, the Olympic uh, gods that we're talking about. So he would be like the brother of, of Zeus or Zeus. But you also had parent gods in that pantheon, like Kronos, that created the Olympic gods. So these are kind of a lower level of god compared to the parent gods. And again, that's similar on pantheons around the world. But these gods did control their specific empires and did have temples set up to, to, to worship them. And the the bloodline that they created was the dynastic kings that would come thereafter, and so there were the what you would call the divine representative of the gods on earth doing their will on earth and running things the way that they were supposed to run things, and so. When you look at Aquaman, he and I haven't seen the movie, but he's probably got a Triton spear, and that comes from, you know, Poseidon, and uh, he's uh, probably going to be exhibiting that he has some sort of royal bloodlines back to the kings, which would be, at, you know, Atlantis that that they're talking about, um, and so the allegories and the connections that sort of go back back to. Probably what's an Aquaman understanding, haven't seen it. I would expect that they're all going to be rooted in that, that Atlantean mythology, and thus in Poseidon, who is the god over it. Yeah, it's actually interesting you mentioned that, because that is 100% the case, because I, I, I saw the movie, and uh, yeah, his mom in the film is the queen and his dad, or queen of Atlantis, and his dad is just a normal like human being, and... Uh, yeah, they get together and they have him as their kid. But um, yeah, you're totally right. That's the whole plot of the film is that him basically retaking his rightful place as the king of Atlantis and then also forming basically a one a one world government of ocean countries or yes. ocean kingdoms, I guess you could call it. Yep. That's literally the entire plot of the movie. Yeah, and and you know a couple a couple of points on that is that um, you have a sort of a dualistic thing that goes on in the polytheist belief systems and mythologies is you have uh, good gods, evil gods. You have good heroes, evil heroes. So her be a good nephilim, and uh, typically Atlas would be probably considered uh, an evil one. Um, it's like a good elf and a bad elf, uh, or a, a, a white witch and a black witch. White magic, black magic. It's that same sort of thing that dominates. So you need to understand that. But it's all polytheism. So also understand that they have the same pantheon of gods. Mm -hmm. The second aspect is that it's this world government aspect, which is really important for people to understand. And even though they're just talking about it's you know, an oceanic, they're actually playing on the idea that, you know, Atlantis in, in mythology was trying to establish a world government through uh, force, um, but was, but was uh, checked and then comes the flood. Now, what's important about that is that there is a very influential person in history and in occultism who, who walked on both sides. And his name was Francis Bacon, and he is the inspirational founder for the Royal Society that education in all science still reports back to today. And his portrait hangs in the entrance of, of the Royal Society. And it's also called the Invisible College, which is the Rosicrucian name for it because they're the invisible ones. So he wrote a book 
that in several writings that sort of inspired uh, the age of science, as, as, as the secret societies uh, like to call it. And what that book that is appropriate here is The New Atlantis. Mm. And in this book, he, he dreamed about a world government that had a universal religion that worked in with science and was there to take humankind to the next level or an evolution in, in, into godhood. Mm-hmm. And so this is what they're trying to recreate when you hear about from the conspiracy theories, and I write extensively about it, the globalists who want to recreate, uh, who want to create a world government. This is the new Atlantis that they're built. Mm. Yeah, and when we look at, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say, um, I told, like, I, I want to ask you one more question about the pre-flood world, cause, uh, world because this is definitely something I want to get into next is the idea of what does Atlantis mean to, you know, the occult and to the new world order and, and all that stuff. I, I definitely, that was, that was going to be the next segment I definitely want to get into, but real quick, I just wanted to ask one more question related in relation to the pre-flood world. And that's what, I mean, I, I forgot what the author was, but there was a person that I remember reading about saying that the antediluvian world had maybe something like five or 600 million people living in it. And I was just wondering, yeah, how many people do you think lived on the earth at the time of Noah's flood? And like you mentioned that there were other kingdoms besides Atlantis. What were those kingdoms? Like what were some of the names of them and where were they comprised at? Well, if you want like the names of the kings, you should go like into the Sumerian. And there's not a lot of records, but you have uh, the kings list in the Sumerian tradition, and it will list the ten demigod kings before the flood, and which is obviously connected with the account that I'm giving would be the Epic of Gilgamesh. So Upnapishtim uh, is the king of the flood. Uh, or king during the time of the flood, and he's the one who survives the flood with all of his relatives on an ark, which is a very similar story in the macro details to the Noah story. And that king's list takes the kings all the way back to the first king. And in all of the traditions that you have around the world, you have this antediluvian standard of 10 kings or 10 patriarchs of each of those civilizations. So where we have those records, typically through the the Middle East area, you've got different names for all of these different kings. I think they're probably the same king names, but it it could be of separate civilizations as well. Okay. And then in regards, I mean, because I know there's not, there wasn't a world census before the flood, but do you think a number like that, five or six hundred million? Do you think that's realistic? Yeah, I think it was probably greater uh, because this was the golden age. This was where you know you you didn't have to work that hard because everything uh, grew grew in 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 plentiness. And I think that people who were uh, living for for longer ages, just as we have ages being shown in the Bible that they lived to great ages and in other civilizations, and I think they could reproduce rapidly, and I think they did that. And I think childbirth was was easier at that time as well. So I think the population was actually greater than that. I would say it's probably similar to what we had have today. And I think their technology was at where we were at today or even, even greater. But that sort of gets into a prophetic side. Um, but we're not in the end days yet, and if it's going to be like the days of Noah, in the end time, then our technology hasn't advanced to what theirs has if it's going to be like the days of Noah. So that's where, where I take that from. Okay. I, I would say, I would also say, you know, just to throw out another name uh, uh, that's not in the Sumerian tradition, I would look at Deucalion as also being a king. And Deucalion is a name that comes out of the Greek blood story where he has Pyrrha on the wife, but he's son of Prometheus, which makes him another demigod as well. So, Okay. And so you mentioned Francis Bacon and you mentioned the writing of his book, The New Atlantis. So I wanted to ask you, so people that are listening to this, they might think, okay, you know, what is all this talk of Atlantis actually, how does that matter today? And I wanted to ask you about the connections between 
Atlantis, how people view it and how it's impacted the occult, how it's impacted people that we would maybe associate with like the Illuminati or secret societies. And just it maybe explain how Atlantis isn't just something that, I mean, it's not only a physical place, but that, or it wasn't only a physical place, but it also seems to have some kind of spiritual significance to it too. And, you know, for people that might not know this, I mean, the Atlantic Ocean got its name from Atlantis, right? And, you know, you look at the biggest, you know, you know, or, um, you know, military treaty of all time is, you know, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? And, you know, it's based out of, you know, and the United Nations is based in New York City, which touches what, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, right? I mean, New York State does, right? And, yeah, so maybe if you wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit and explaining some of its significance to today. Sure. And also, you know, Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, his name is based in Atlantis. And Ethiopia takes its etymology back to Atlantis and the Atlantic uh, Mountains. And originally, Ethiopia was in North Africa, where those mountains are located. Um, So there's a lot of connections back to um, Atlantis. But in and what I'm going to talk about now is is for the audience to understand is it's not important whether they believe this or whether I believe that. What's important is is the people I'm, in organizations I'm going to talk about now believe this, and it's what they're doing with that information which is important to understand. And so they take their organizations and their religion back to Atlantis and the civilizations before the flood. They take their bloodlines and their genealogies back to these demigods that we've been talking about, uh, back to the flood. And they're trying to recreate this whole new golden age that they like to poetically call the new Atlantis or the new age, as Francis Bacon has called it, the, the new Atlantis. And they've been working on this since the flood, since it was destroyed. So this is a transgenerational set of plans, strategy, organizations, and and religions. And so I'm talking about the Gnostics and the secret societies in the West, although you have other aspects that go around the world from whether or not it's the Chinese bloodlines or wherever you want to go in the world. But we'll talk about the West because that's what most people are familiar with. So you have these, this, this, Gnostic religion that's being assembled, which is the original religion before the flood and the original religion of Babel that they're trying to bring home, that they basically believe that the pantheon is the same pantheon around the world with just different vernacular names and similar narratives with different vernacular names in those in those narratives. So they're, they believe it's the same one religion and the same one religion that was in Atlantis And they want to bring about this new golden age, which they believe can only take place if you have everything under one one world government and one universal religion. And they believe that there is this this bloodline and the spark of the divine or a thousand points of light, as uh, people are probably familiar with and how that's termed, that they're trying to unite in, in, in this end world. And so the organizations that were spawned off of the, the religion and this, this transgenerational um, vision and strategy that they were trying to bring about, as we understood them today, come out of the Knights Templar, which is broken up in 1307 into several different orders. But the key order that all of these organizations report to are the Rosicrucians. So underneath that, you have the Illuminati, and underneath that, you have the Freemasons. And then you have other organizations, whether or not it's the Jesuits or the um, Bohemian Grove or um, the Bilderbergers or the Club of Rome, which I do want to touch on here in a second, that are going to report into the Rosicrucians because that's made up at the top 50% level of the purebloods that are the descendants of these bloodlines that are kept alive in all of our entertainment in history, whether it's Shakespeare or it's this Aquaman movie or it's the vampire mythos or it's the fairy tales, science fiction. They put it all in there all the time and hide everything in, in plain sight. So this is 
the the scenario that they're trying to recreate so that they can evolve into godhood and and and, and vibrate or have a you know uh, a vibration that uh, brings about this quantum evolution in, 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 into godhood. There's an organization that was um, created in the late '60s called the Club of Rome, and its role. And you can Google the Club of Rome. And I'm from Canada, and so Pierre Trudeau who was prime minister at Canada, and of course he married into the St. Clair family, which is created Freemasonry. And again, it's always about bloodlines and control and power when you dig into this stuff. And so this Club of Rome was designed to bring about a preconceived geopolitical scenario that has the world divided into 10 blocks of nations, 10 groups of nations, 10 empires, 10 spheres of influence, however you want to call it, that they've been trying to bring about mostly through spheres of influence and trading blocks that would come together as a representative of each for 10 nations in this world government that they're bringing about. And they report directly to uh, the the upper half of the Rosicrucians. And they've been working actively on this, although they haven't been successful yet in bringing it about. But it's their plan to have 10, which is the same number that is in the Atlantean Empire. And what's important to remember on that, if people understand Bible prophecy, uh, it's a very important number for prophecy because Daniel and Revelation both talk about in the end time that there will be 10 kings ruling over the world um, that I think that these secret societies are trying to bring about. And they're trying to bring about this world that's ruled by the bloodlines that ruled of old through the whole world and worshiping the same gods that they have, that they worshiped before the flood and to have another rebellion like happened before the flood, which is going to bring about Armageddon. Hmm. So when you say these royal bloodlines, are these people that, if they go back far enough, they have a little bit of um, Nephilim blood in them? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, and actually more than that. um, They would say that they have intermarried throughout the millennia, just as the royals have intermarried um, ever since the flood that, that we can document to keep those bloodlines pure. And those are those kingships were the Nephilim, or as we know them after the flood, the Raphaim dynasties um, that ruled the world and set up a complete noble class in the feudal system because they consider themselves superior coming from fallen angels. And as you go down through the generations, back to the Raphaim, back to the fallen angels or the gods. And they keep these genealogies. And they track them because within their organizational structure and within their secret culture, pedigree is all important. So the purer bloodline, the more, the higher up you are on, on the hierarchy. And so they continue to intermarry all the way throughout. And we see that with royal families right up to our time that they continue to try and intermarry with the nobility class in as pure bloodlines as they can, but also trying to ensure they don't take on blood diseases. So they've got that challenge, which causes uh, a watering down. So if you go sort of roll back 100 years, you look at World War One, you have all of these kings, whether it's the Romanovs of of uh, Russia or the Kaiser Kings of, you know, with Wilhelm in Germany or the Habsburgs in Austria or the Hungarian uh, Kings and the English Kings of the House of Windsor and the Spanish Kings. All of these were cousins because they all intermarried to keep those bloodlines pure. So this was a war between a family And that continues to this day. And as you go higher up, these families aren't as visible as what they were in the past, but they're still in behind controlling all of the different organizations that is moving this in a direction where uh, they can take over the world. And all of these bloodlines want to be able to produce their messiah who is going to rule the ten kings of this new Atlantean empire. Mm. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that these people are all related because 
and I wasn't even thinking about this in preparing for our interview, but um, or our talk today. But last night, I I just had problem. I just had a little uh, issue of going to sleep, and uh, I watched a number of videos that this guy has on YouTube. I can't remember his channel, but he makes a lot of charts of genealogies, and he did one of all of the relatives of Queen Elizabeth, the other patriarchs or uh, sorry monarchs of uh, Europe. And I was just surprised to hear it. Like the king of Spain today is third cousins to Queen Elizabeth. Um, I think it's the king of Norway is like second cousin. And I mean, I can't remember all the monarchies of Europe. And I'm sure I'll say one that doesn't have a monarchy. Then I'll look like a fool. But, <laughs> you know, there's, you know, because there's something, you know, there's Denmark, Sweden, Nor- what, what I don't forget which ones have and which ones don't. But they're all related to her. And I was shocked because I was like, wait a minute, what? Like, because I knew what you were saying that I knew that the leaders of the West of um, Europe during World War One, I, I knew that most of them were related, the ones that had the monarchies. But I was surprised to hear that today, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, yeah, and even if they don't have, yeah, and even if even if that royal family doesn't have a throne today, they're still intermarrying, and they still have undisclosed wealth and power, uh, and are working more and more in the backgrounds, and they still intermarry because, again, within that pedigree, they need that genealogy list to assert where they fit within that organization. Because as I said, the, the, the pure, the bloodline, um, the higher up you're, you're recognized. And, you know, the king of uh, Spain, which is interesting that you mentioned them, is, is they, they're the Bourbon family, and they're actually a succession uh, as well as from the Habsburg-Lorraine dynasty. And this Habsburg-Lorraine dynasty, you know, were the uh, the Holy Roman Empire kings, right? And uh, they uh, also carried the King of Jerusalem title, which uh, the current King of Spain does. Um, and this King of Jerusalem title comes from the you know the Lorraine region as it's it's passed down because three families come out of the Lorraine region. Uh, where they carried uh, this King of Jerusalem title forward from 1118. And this is the Anjou family who produces the Plantagenet, which produced uh, most of the English and and, and French kings, and most of the presidents take their genealogies back to Prince John, who you have the Magna Carta, whose last name was Plantagenet. And you also have two other names in there uh, from the Lorraine region, which was um, de Bouillon de Payot. And what's important about that is, is those three names are part of the three founders of the Knights Templar um, who control the inner organization, which is called the Priory of Sion. And if people don't believe the Priory of Sion was an actual organization, again, get a hold of me. I'll give you some historical references to show when and how they existed. And Baldwin who is the brother of de Bouillon, is crowned king of Jerusalem in a small priory in Zion, in Zion um, called the Notre, Notre Dame uh, de Sion, and is crowned king of Jerusalem because of their bloodline. So their bloodlines, whether it's Anjou, de Payan, or de Bouillon, all come out of the Merovingian dynasty, uh, as descendants of them that go back all the way to uh, with a scion happening, and that's grafting in and of another blood, bloodline in, in how the occult express it, back to King uh, Saul, first king of Israel. And King Saul is a Benjamite. And what's important about that is Joshua, at the time of the conquest of the land, awards Jerusalem to the Benjamites. And so they crowned themselves King of Jerusalem in 1118, and that's the title that has moved forward also with that double cross of Lorraine that you see on Oreo Cookie and a few other iconology that follows them on their coat of arms and and, and their iconography, all the way down to the King of Spain today. And that's because this bloodline in particular wants to be able to crown a true king of Jerusalem in the temple in the end time, which is known as the abomination. And that's going to be Antichrist, the one that who's going to rule over these ten kingdoms and actually overthrow three of them uh, in the last three and a half years. 
So you think that I'm trying to remember his name. I think it's King Juan. I think he's the king of Spain right now. I might be incorrect, but I think it might be him. But so that was his father. Philippe is king today. Okay. Oh, yeah. So his father's still alive, right? Juan. No, his father. No, he. I believe he he died. Okay. Uh, at least the title is passed on. But King Juan also had the King of Jerusalem title. Okay. So you believe then that there will eventually be a king of Spain will be connected to the Antichrist then? That there'll be some kind of symbolic gesture that he'll do that basically is tied to, um, you know, the prophetic pro- prophecy for the end of the world? Yeah, no. Yeah, no, I wouldn't quite go that far. I would tie the King of Jerusalem title. It's moved from uh, French kings to... Austrian kings to the Spanish kings now. So it moves around as that pedigree moves around. And so the next generation that it moves on to may not be Philippe. It could go on to another king elsewhere. Okay. So if you had to, let's say, if you could speak candidly with someone that is in one of the royal bloodlines, um, if you could speak with them candidly or just someone that's connected to all of this stuff or someone that's very high up and you know, behind the scenes, kind of secret societies are very involved with the cult. How would they describe the significance of Atlantis to them? Is it something that would it be something akin to the way that Christians look at this, like the New Jerusalem, like when it comes that you know it's going to begin the millennial reign for Christ? I'm not saying that it th- their view of it is equal, but in that, do they view it as something very significant to them? Like, do they view it as Something. I mean, because you've already talked about the fact that they want to initiate, you know, a new, a new age slash, you know, new world order type of thing. But is it? I mean, it, it, is there something more spiritual to it for them as well? Like when they view it, is there some kind of, I guess, satanic energy type of thing that they're trying to associate with when they talk about it, when they view it, or is it just more pragmatic? Just we want to start, you know, a new, a new no, power no, no. to the planet. No, it, it's, it's, it's as you describe it, um, because what they have to do is unite the spark of this divine uh, that is or the gene of Isis or the real bloodline that's dispersed around the world. They need to unite this so that um, under one government and one religion, which will be this new age of peace and prosperity, to, but also to ignite them into... Uh, a vibration into the next level of evolution. So th- this is their nirvana. This is their millennium. This is their dream future that they will have a realm separate from the God of the universe and uh, bring themselves back to this state of godhood that the original Nephilim were given by the original gods and fallen angels. Mm, okay. And I guess... How do they view everyday normal people? Like how how was I guess how do you and I and the people listening to this eventually how how do we fit into what they want to do? I mean, do they view us as useful tools or do they view us as, you know, disposable or do they hate us or well, I guess what would you say is their relationship or their view towards quote yeah, everyday call, normal people? They they call us mundane and they call us cattle. And they were there only for sacrifice and for servitude. And except for that purpose, they would wipe us from the face of the earth if they could. And you see this reflected in what most people believe are spons- uh, a set of stones with writings on them that are sponsored by the Rosicrucians, which are the Georgia Guidestones, which wants to reduce the earth to 500 million people. This isn't for... 500 million humans. This is for mostly these purebloods uh, and the few that they're going to keep. And I would think the ones that they're going to keep are probably going to be hybrids. Um, but again, they're still considered inferior only for servitude, work, and uh, sacrifice, just as it was before the flood. And so these beings... Um, they they did not treat humankind well. We were there for sacrifice. We were there for slaves. And this is this comes through in all of the accounts around the world. And that's the world that they want to replace. And humans are considered 
inferior beings that are treated like cattle. We see a lot with um, the entertainment industry and you know other industries too. You know, corporate America or just corporate corporatism around the world. I guess you could say that you see a lot of people that are perceived to be you know everyday people that make it big. You know, let's say for example, you look at a person like Katy Perry, or you look at a person like um, you know Jeff Bezos. Let's say for example, right? These are people that at least generally are perceived to be just normal people that make it big, right? Or they become very successful. Obviously, with the world structure that we have now, these people have to be rubbing shoulders with these pure bloods or the royal bloodlines, right? And I mean, are these people, are they, do they have humble beginnings the way that we think that they do? Or do you think there's something more to it that there's a little bit of something that guides yeah. them to success? Oh, I think there, there's help. Um, but there are people that make it on their own. Um, but a lot of the ones that do make it on their own um, will be sponsored and, and, and uh, will have connections back to these bloodlines. But the new money that comes in, and understand this is where new money and old money comes from, the new money isn't considered like the old money. The, the new ones coming in aren't considered like the older bloodlines. And so... What the new ones do, they get introduced, whether or not it's in the lower Bilderberger organization and places like Bohemian Grove and so many others. They'll start to interact with um, these these older bloodlines and, and, and purebloods, but they can't rise in that hierarchy unless they start to have their children intermarry with these bloodlines. So what they're trading for... The people who become new money, whether it's Bill Gates or whomever, um, they join these organizations in the hopes of having their children intermarry into these bloodlines, which will have a higher position in future generations. Okay. Well, that definitely, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I, I guess another thing, too, I was wondering. So we see with a lot of the monarchies in Europe – a lot of, I mean, at least in the past, and maybe my perception's wrong, but there's a lot of Christian imagery associated with them, a lot of crosses, a lot of, especially in the English um, monarchy where in the past there was the idea of, you know, them being Christians and defenders of the faith and things like that. Do you believe that those monarchs at the time were actually seeking out that goal and then over time they got corrupted? Or do you think that they were always corrupted and that they just kind of put on a facade? Well, I think there were kings and some dynasties that would have supported uh, the Roman church. Um, but their true beliefs were always different at the core than what they were on the surface, and, and it's always about power. So you have sort of this pushback over history of, you know, some dynasties being toppled and being replaced, and there's always sort of this battle. And they actually talk about it within the societies and their history. Um, you know, for example, there was a an order that was created a little bit after the fall of the Templars on mainland Europe that was designed to replace uh, the dragon kings that had been pushed off the throne. And they called this the Sarkani Rond or the Ordo Draconis. And uh, it was uh, started in about 1408, but had the, 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 the push of the Rosicrucians, which formed in 1188 at the cutting of the elms and before the fall of the Templars, in preparation for the, the, the fall of the Templars, because there's a falling out. And this is the bloodlines that originally started uh, the Templar organization. And what this organization, the Ordo Dorcanos, Dorcanos uh, was designed to do was is to put the dragon kingships back on the throne and to continue the pursuits of Thoth. So again, it's this knowledge, this ancient religion, uh, and the bloodlines that they're trying to put back into control and power. This, uh, in interesting, uh, interestingly enough, is the same organization that in about 1439, uh, Vlad III, son of Vlad II, um, is in inter uh, inducted into uh, as part of this uh, organization of kings and bloodlines and of course that is the uh, individual that dracula is based on um, as being a noble celt um, and of course 
Dracula is son of a dragon as you take that back in its meaning, which is the dragon bloodlines, which is, you know, goes back to the Nephilim bloodlines. I think we might have covered this off on another show. And what's also interesting about that is Prince Charles, and I have a link for this if people want it, is on record a few times of saying that he takes his bloodlines back to guess who? Vlad the Impaler. Mm, I have heard that actually, that yeah, that he's related to him. You mentioned Thoth and I saw a video maybe two weeks ago on YouTube that it talked about Thoth and I had never heard of him before. What is Thoth or what is the, is it the cult of Thoth that is based off of a, an individual that at one time existed? Yeah, Thoth is in pretty much all of the different pantheons with different names and uh, in a couple different versions of them in each. And so he's looked upon as the god of wisdom the god of knowledge, which is where the Gnostics and the Gnosis cult of knowledge comes from that the secret societies believe in. And the Egyptian religion is very, very important to the secret society. So you see a lot of Egyptian imagery and Freemasonry in the Rosicrucians. And so Thoth is either thought to be an actual god or he is one of the uh, demigods who is a liaison between heaven and earth but bringing knowledge from the gods to the humans and creating religious orders in their religion um, with this knowledge from heaven and in return to worship for for uh, to worship the gods in heaven and so every religion has a wisdom god and in thought in egypt it's it is thoth and you also get this fused in with Hermes as well as it crosses over some of the different cultures and you have, you know, the three times uh, Hermes are, uh, I always struggle with trying to say Hermegistus. Okay. Uh, and I know I just, tri- Her- Hermetergistus. Anyways, three times Hermes is what it's, what it, what it means. And so that means there was three individuals that they conflate into one as the mythos goes. And one is the God before the flood. And the second one is Enoch, uh, uh, son of Cain and known by many different names around around the Mediterranean, but thought to be the same individual as Mercury, as an example. Um, and he he is the leader of this priesthood or the companions of Horus, as they might be called in the Egyptian religion, or the Sabeti, uh, or uh, the Seven Sages, as they're known in other Uh, polytheist cultures and religions and they start this knowledge-based religion and then you have another one that's after the flood which is where the hermes comes in which the secret societies say is harmes who finds this knowledge and and partners with nimrod at at babel and so you have that three times hermes so it's kind of like this continuation of this individual but it all goes back to a specific god who provides knowledge, and you have one of those in all of the different pantheons. The the Enoch that you just talked about, that's a different Enoch than the one that got um, taken up to heaven by God, and the one that's believed to have written the books of Enoch, or at least the first book of Enoch? At least the first book of Enoch, yeah. So there are two different ones, and, and again, most people don't understand this, and the secret societies tend to conflate the two so that they can get some sort of cover from uh, the Roman church. Um, so you have Enoch, son of Cain, which is the first one that comes along, and he's the one who develops the seven sciences, which we know as the seven liberal sciences today, and develops the secret societies and the mystery schools and, and the mystery religion before the flood, which is going to partner with the illicit knowledge in around the sixth generation um, at the time of the birth of the Nephilim that's going to be used in partnership with the Nephilim to take over the entire antediluvian world, which, they, again, they have planned in, in, in the end time. And as opposed to Enoch, that is son of Jared, of the Seth line, which is the third-born uh, son of, of Adam after Abel is murdered by Cain, who uses this knowledge for good. And this all comes out of Albert Mackey and the um, history of Freemasonry and uh, based on what they call the Polychronicon, which is their greater history of oral traditions that come down through time and again the masons take their creation of their organization back to enoch son of cain 
just as they have Lamech, which is also on both sides. But again, Lamech, descendant of Enoch and Cain, and Nama, who married giants, and Jubel, which is the one who uh, uh, did a renaissance on, on the fifth science with his geometry called in the craft masonry to, for, for buildings, and Tubal Cain. Because mm. the Enoch, the descendant of Seth, he's the grandfather of Noah, or the great grandfather of Noah. Yeah, he's uh, he's a an ancestor of of Noah. Yes, so I think Lamech is actually the grandfather of um, of, of uh, Noah, as I recall. But I have to double check that. Okay. Um, wow. So I didn't, I didn't know there was two Lamechs. Yes. And and the pillars that Hermes find in that Termesca, uh, Hermes three times uh, Hermes uh, story that I was talking about, um, Lamech, although they also have an account in Secret Societies that Enoch uh, did this as well, but it seems to me Lamech is more accurate based on the generations. They build two pillars, and you see these two pillars in um, Freemasonry. Uh, they're not Joachim and Boaz, as the lower levels believe. They're the pillars of Lamech and Enoch. And on those two pillars, they write uh, the knowledge of the seven sacred sciences and the religion, and where Enoch creates all of his knowledge in 36,525 books, on uh, puts them in nine volts, stacked on top of each other, and buried underneath the pyramids, which they also accredit uh, Enoch for developing the knowledge to build uh, that Hermes finds after the flood and brings that knowledge and brings that religion back to Babel where he partners with Nimrod to uh, create Babel City and the Babel Tower. And we see that knowledge being reflected in the Bible at least I think so, where it says acting as one people under one language, there is nothing that will be prevented from them doing. And the first thing they do is start to bring, build this great megalith in, into the sky. Hmm. And this was concurrent. Well, I guess no. the Tower of Babel, that was Atlantis was already wiped off the face of the earth, right? That had already been destroyed. Correct. OK. Do you think that there were, well... I guess, well, I'm just trying to think chronologically, because the Tower of Babel was how many centuries after the flood? Like three or four? Oh, no, sooner than that. It was uh, started before the flood, so probably finished somewhere around 100 years after the flood. So I would say it would be started around 70 to 80 years after the flood. Because that's always something that I've, like, because, you know, sometimes, especially like what you mentioned earlier, in the book of Genesis, especially everybody before Abraham largely you know, you see these long lifespans, and I think that, you know, people might not, they might forget the fact that some of these people kind of overlap. So, for example, Noah, he saw the tower, or he was alive when the Tower of Babel was built, right? Yeah, that's correct, because he lived to be, uh, according to the Bible, 950 years, 600 before the flood, 350 after the flood. So, he lived well after the time of the Tower of Babel. How many people do you think were there at the tower? I mean, are we, do you think it was in the realms of like 100,000? Uh, this is third generation and within 100 years. Um, so if there's only eight on, on the uh, boat, on the ark, then no, I don't think there would have been uh, that many. I okay. mean, uh, I mean, even if they pro procreated quickly and in numbers, it wouldn't have been a, a huge number, right? No, that's a good point. And did Noah, did he live? I can't remember this either. Did he live to see Abraham? Uh, it would have been close, but I don't think quite. Okay. I think uh, about 360 years, as I remember, um, after the flood when Abraham was born in that zone. So I think it would have been just after the death of Noah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's so many things, especially, I mean, there's so many things in history that it seems like a lot of people don't really know that much about. I mean, anything that's pre-flood, it just seems like there's hardly, and people don't really, they're never really taught anything about it. They don't really even really analyze it. And, you know, I feel like, especially from like a secular standpoint, they will just throw out these years where they say, you know, this happened 20,000 BC or something. And I think in a lot of people's minds, it, they don't even, it's like, okay, that just seems like a really big number. That just seems like a really long time ago. 
and then it really put together the idea that it's like, well, I mean, things were actually happening. <laughs> you know, I mean, things were happening on the earth just because there's not a lot of records of it doesn't mean that things weren't actually going on. Yep. Yeah, and and we just may not know where or how to look for it yet either, right? So uh, there'll I, be. I think there's a lot more going on to, than what uh, secular science wants to release. But I also know that because they're backed by uh, the Royal Society, is, is that at the top they know. I mean, between the Vatican and Freemasonry and the Rosicrucians, they have vaults and vaults and vaults of knowledge of what happened in prehistory. But they tend to, both sides tend to want to control that information. Is it like that scene from Indiana Jones 1? Where yeah. they had the big vault of all the of all the stuff? I think it would be quite similar to that, yes. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, all right, Gary. Well, definitely, thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to talk, or maybe next time you come on, we can dive more into this idea of vampires and where that comes from and the occult meaning behind that. But uh, definitely, I want to thank you for the conversation today. And um, how can we follow you online? Do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, no, I do not have a YouTube channel, although okay. a few people have uh, created ones that were supposedly mine. But no, I do not have one. Um, I am looking at putting one up just to sort of counterbalance some of that so that people know who they're dealing with. But you can get a hold of me through my website okay. at the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com. That's Genesis 6 with the number 6 Conspiracy.com. And on there, I have a generous excerpt onto my email. You can buy a signed copy of my book if you want, or you can link over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or to Kindle. And also, there's an email contact on me that you can get a hold of me through the website. People can also follow me on uh, Facebook under Gary Wayne, and I have uh, a Gary Wayne Genesis 6 Conspiracy group and a few Genesis 6 Conspiracy pages. And you can also follow me on Twitter at GaryWayne63, at GaryWayne63. And if you are looking for that information or if you do have a question, I will get back to you and I will get you that information. All right, perfect. Well, thank you again so much, Gary, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. All right. All right, bye.